Hey, welcome to Lutheran Basics. My name is Pastor Jonathan Petzold. I serve as the senior pastor here at Trinity. And I'm Krista. I'm Pastor Jonathan's wife. Um, this is lesson two out of six in the uh, Introduction to Lutheranism series, which is the core content for the new member class here at Trinity. Uh, the new member class also has an in-person component, so uh, make sure that you jot down your questions as you follow along in your journal and bring them with you. Um, when you come to the discussion time. So we're doing, uh, last time we talked about the Bible, we, we read the creation story and set kind of the foundation. We're diving this week into the small catechism and we're going to be talking um, about the means of grace. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have a small catechism, you notice there's six chief parts and um, they are in a certain order and Luther put them in that order for specific reasons theologically. So like the Ten Commandments are first, um, because when we first encounter God, we are confronted with the law, right? This is what God expects of us, and then we we cannot do it, and we all fall short, right? Um, then you have the creed. Uh, so when we are confronted with the law, what do we need? We need Jesus. And the mm -hmm. creed tells us uh, about that the God who created the earth sent his son to die for us and to rise again and gives us that story, mm -hmm. uh, that objective story, um, so that we can look to Jesus for help. Then uh, comes the Lord's Prayer. So once we know that we need God and that Jesus has come for us, then that restores our relationship with the Father and we can uh, call out to God in prayer. Um, and then we have... Uh, the means of grace. So baptism, confession, absolution, and the Lord's Supper, um, which those are G how Jesus responds to us, how God reaches to mm -hmm. us and connects us to himself. Right. Um, so, but I think that Pastor Jonathan has found in his experience that people re have a lot of questions about baptism and communion. And so if he does those later in the class, like they just keep getting brought up because people right. have questions. So <laughs> he's doing them first because, uh, you know, then this is like very, this is how, what, you know, when you walk into a church and you notice that it's different from the other church down the street, that it's probably like the first thing you notice is differences about the sacraments. Right. So it's really right. helpful to kind of establish that groundwork. Right. 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 So we're going to talk about the means of grace, lesson two, uh, kind of like the God who comes to us. Mm -hmm. So what our relationship with God is kind of founded upon is what he does for us. Right. So as you listen, uh, follow along. We'll begin on page five in your journal. Yeah. So um, last time we talked about how a religion is like a story, right? It's like mm -hmm. the what we believe about everything. Um, but the thing about it is <laughs> that, um, it's a, the true, it's true, right? Our, what true. we believe yeah. is true. And that means that it's not just our personal story. Mm -hmm. Um, it is the story of the whole world. So everyone is in this story, whether they know it or not. Um, everyone has a relationship with God, whether it's a good relationship or not. Right. Um, and our, in our salvation, while it is personal and individual, um, it's not subjective, right? Right. It's right. objective. Yeah. So it's objective, uh, and, and really, your salvation was accomplished about well, uh, as you can read in your journal, two thousand years ago, uh, at Jesus's death and resurrection. Right. So we would say salvation is not a subjective thing, like you just said. It's it's historical, um, and and that's actually really good news for us because it's not up to you or up to me uh, to save ourselves. Uh, it's, it's something that's done to us and, and for us. Uh, it's, it's a gift that's given to us. So, so that's, that's what we call the means of grace and it is how that salvation that was accomplished for you 2,000 years ago is delivered to you today. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jesus gives us the means of grace. So there's a couple of fill in the blanks for you. Um, he gives us the means of grace to give us comfort and assurance of our salvation by connecting us to his death and resurrection. Right? Yes. So, um, the means of grace are the sacraments, mm -hmm. right? Plus mm -hmm. confession. Plus, yeah, which plus is confession like and absolution. Right. Yeah, like, like, kind of... Sometimes you'll hear Lutherans say we have three sacraments, sometimes two. Uh, I like to, you know, mess with people and say two and a half. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we have yeah. three means of grace, two sacraments. Right. Two of those are sacraments. Yeah, and let's... 
let's actually like uh, define that. So next mm -hmm. in your in your journal, you should see that question: What three things make a sacrament? Mm -hmm. By the way, as we go, if you want want to pause and and uh, read a little bit more into that, uh, in parentheses we've got the small catechism with explanation. Uh, it's that larger part mm -hmm. uh, in the latter part of the, of yeah. the catechism you have, uh, and then uh, this would be two eighty two question uh, page two eighty two, and you can go to question two hundred ninety three. So, and there's a lot of extra scripture passages in right. here. So like if we say something and you're like, that can't be right, you can look it up and you can read all those Bible verses and, and see what you think. Right, right. So, uh, but, but simply summarizing right now, what three things make a sacrament? Um, so first, um, it's instituted by the command of Christ, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, second, uh, the word of God is joined to a visible element. Mm -hmm. So in baptism, that's water. And in... Um, communion it's bread and wine, bread and, wine. Uh, and then uh, third it bestows forgiveness of sins uh, which were won for us uh, on the cross right it, right it delivers that forgiveness to us all right well six minutes in and here's a quiz for you how many sacraments are there you know we just talked about this right uh, yeah. <laughs> so we, you can say two, two sacraments um, uh, baptism is a sacrament because it has all those all those uh, kind it's of commanded by things, Jesus right? it has a visible element, water, yeah, and it delivers, and it delivers the forgiveness. Yeah. Uh, communion, the same thing. Uh, on the night before uh, he was, uh, uh, night that he was betrayed, uh, he has that last supper with the disciples. He institutes the Lord's supper. He connects his uh, body and blood to bread and wine, the the visible elements there, and it, it delivers the forgiveness that he wins for us on the cross uh, in in his body and in his blood. Uh, so, but why why does uh, confession and absolution not qualify? So there's no element. There's no physical element, right? Right. So you still receive the forgiveness of sins. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's what absolution is. Yeah. 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 Uh, and and it was instituted by Christ to go and forget. Yes. You know the office of the keys. Right. Right. We're getting ahead now. Yeah, we are getting ahead. So let, let's let's uh, let's actually uh, move forward. So uh, we're we're going to start then with baptism and talk about baptism. So uh, let's let's read where Jesus instituted baptism. Uh, Matthew twenty eight verse nineteen. Right at the very end of his uh, earthly ministry and and as we hear this uh, we can think how does baptism tell us tell this uh, how does this uh, oh, I made a typo you will fix a typo before you see it so how does this tell us what baptism is and how baptism defines who we are okay um, Jesus came and said to them all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, so Jesus has a fair amount of authority then. So this is right before he leaves, right? And right. he says he's got <laughs> all authority has been given to him. Yep. In heaven and on earth. And, and, and then right after he, he ascends yeah. into heaven to uh, reign over all things. I really like to include the verse right before... Because it, it says, when they saw him, this is the disciples, right? Before Jesus leaves, right? When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Mm. And then Jesus comes and says this to them, and it's comforting, right? He says, essentially, don't worry. All authority in heaven and on right. earth has been given to me. Right, right. Um, so this is like his last kind of encouragement, yeah. right? Yeah, before before he ascends into heaven. So, um, so, so here, uh, by that... that uh, cosmic authority that Jesus has he can't get any much can't get much higher than uh, all. being <laughs> all uh, in heaven and on earth uh, by that by that word then where it's that same word where he said in the beginning let there be light and there was light and he created light right by that word uh, he then says uh, you go and you make disciples of all nations by baptizing them uh, and and in bat baptism by the word of Jesus he places the 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 uh, triune name on his people, and so you can kind of think that with the name comes all of the work of each person of the Trinity, and we'll talk about that as we go uh, in the next few weeks. But you have like a restored relationship with the Father um, and the Spirit who gives you faith, and then of course Jesus, what He accomplishes on the cross by His death and resurrection. Uh, is yours in his name that he places on you in baptism, right? So, 
Um, so kind of a cool thing to think about. So let's actually dive into the small catechism and what it says about that. Yeah, so this is on page 23, and I'm just going to read it, yeah, right? Go for it. Um, what is baptism? Baptism is not just plain water, but it is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. Which is that word of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. What benefits does baptism give? It works forgiveness of sins, res rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare. Which are these words and promises of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, 16. How can water do such great things? Certainly not just water, but the word of God in and with the water does these things, along with the faith which trusts this word of God in the water. For without God's word, the water is plain water and no baptism. But with the word of God, it is a baptism that is a life-giving water, rich in grace, and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. Awesome. And is there a last one, one oh. more? Uh, what does such baptizing with water indicate? It indicates that the old Adam in us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires, and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Where is this written? St. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So, all right, cool. Thank you for reading that. So so what are the, the two things present in baptism? Uh, you've got water, mm -hmm. uh, and then we would also say with the waters, are, there's also the word. So the, the water is like what makes God's word uh, kind of tangible. tangible. And like, like you can like watch it like... Uh, drip over you, right? Uh, right? Where God's word is is covering you. So uh, God knows that we we are creatures. We are tangible beings. Like yeah. we need things that we can touch and understand right. and like pinpoint in space and time. Right. So just as Jesus's death on the cross was an <clears throat> actual event that happened at a place and a moment in history, like mm -hmm. in real life, it was a tangible event. Um, your baptism is a tangible event that you can remember. Even if yeah. you can't remember it, you you might have a picture or you might have a, right. a certificate. Like, you know that it happened. Yeah. And so you can, like, you can touch it. It, it makes your salvation, like, yeah, historical. It, yeah. It, yeah, it makes your salvation historical. I love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, which is also kind of cool because uh, who is it that's baptizing you? Uh, it might be easy to say, like, the pastor. Uh, uh, but... It, it's it's not the pastor's power. It's not like the pastor's mm -hmm. magic juju makes something happen, right? Uh, it's actually Jesus's word, right? right? He's the one that instituted it. Yeah, it's his word that actually comes with the power. Right. So sometimes people say like um, that, you know, uh, we can't be saved by baptism because baptism is a work. Mm. Um, but while baptism is a work, it is not a work of ours. It is a work of God. God mm -hmm. is the one doing all the work in baptism, and we just receive that. Yeah. So we can be saved by Christ's work. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So, uh, and then what, what happens in your baptism is that, uh, what I like to say is that often, like, you know, uh, you can read through the entire Bible, and I, I'm never going to find a verse that says Jesus died for Pastor Jonathan, right? Uh, but baptism uh, is what, what makes Jesus' work uh, personal to you. And it's in baptism that you receive the name of God and that God calls you by name into his kingdom. And so what that does for you then uh, is it is it, um, it, it like wards off, if you will, uh, the power of uh, sin, death, and the devil uh, so that uh, your, your sin no longer um, has uh, you, you no longer carry the guilt of your sins, right? Um, and sin no longer has any claim on you. And then uh, neither does uh, Satan and, and even death itself. Um, 
even though you will die one day, uh, death itself doesn't have any further claim on you. And so you can even say at your baptism, uh, you, you, your, your eternal life starts at your baptism. And because God is putting his na name on you, he's like signing his name to your life, right? Um, that's, your, that's your judgment day verdict early. Mm -hmm. Like you know what God's going to say uh, on judgment day because he's already said it at your baptism. Uh, so, so if God does all those great things, uh, maybe we could ask then, uh, why should babies be baptized? Can you can you read that for us? Yeah. So this is on page two eighty eight in the in your catechism. Why should babies be baptized? Um, and I'm just going to read the summaries. And there's a lot of scripture, so you can go here and look at the verses too. Um, babies are included in the words "all nations." Uh, babies are sinful and need what baptism provides the forgiveness of sins, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so we have verses like, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And there's others too. Um, and then the Holy Spirit is able to work faith in babies. Uh, so we believe that because faith is a gift that comes from outside of us, um, and not something that we do, um, that it is something the Holy Spirit can and does give to children. Yeah, so it might be kind of a weird thing to think about, like, babies being sinful. Um, but but it is true that they are conceived uh, and born in sin. Sin is a curse that's passed down uh, every generation. And, and so babies, like, you could almost say that they contract that contagion of sin and death. And that's why every baby born... Uh, is somebody who will die is because they have that and so they, they need salvation uh, for that um, and and they they need God's promises that that kind of, kind of blossom into into eternal life um, and the Bible says that Jesus is the only way to that eternal life so uh, if you say that babies don't need to be baptized um, and baptism is what gives them the gifts of God that that ties them to uh, what Jesus has done for them on the cross, then you're saying that there's actually an alternative way uh, to be saved uh, other than Jesus, and that's by being a baby, right? Um, sure. And yeah. so, uh, and then and then often the, the reasoning is that, well, babies can't be baptized because they can't understand God or they can't accept God or they... they can't make the decision for themselves. Can't make the decision for themselves. And, and that would be confusing uh, faith with intellectual ability, uh, which is also a dangerous thing to do because... Uh, let, let's be honest, you know, uh, before God, uh, how much uh, more intellectually uh, capable is a human adult to a baby uh, when you're standing before God, you know? Um, and, and it also puts more work uh, or more, more focus on us. If, if you have to attain a certain intellectual ability to be saved, um, then it's, it's not... It's not all what God does for you. Uh, it's it's also you being able to do something to, to save yourself. So um, so that's baptism. Let's let's now go to our next means of grace, uh, which is uh, confession and absolution. So we're going to look at where Jesus instituted confession and absolution uh, in John chapter twenty, uh, and looking at verses nineteen through twenty three. Okay. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Mm, okay, so so there Jesus gives um, special authority to uh, his church, right? And that, that authority is to forgive sins and retain sins. Um, and, and so in this authority, they, they, they can actually deliver the forgiveness that Jesus wins on the cross uh, to people. But that, that is also to say then that uh, Jesus kind of deputizes the church, if you will, uh, to, all right, forgive sins, but then also if there's somebody who is unrepentant to uh, say that those sins are not forgiven until they, they would repent, which maybe brings up a good question. Uh, what What is repentance or what is confession? So let's, let's look at the small catechism then. Let's ask, like, uh, what are the two parts of confession? Mm -hmm. So 
confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins. And second, that we receive absolution, that is forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. All right, so there's two parts then. So there's actually confessing the sins, like acknowledging, all right, yep, I'm a sinner, I need forgiveness, and then receiving absolution. And it always works like a boomerang. Like you you, you never get have one without the, the other, right? Um, <clears throat> and then do we can no, do we can have to confess all of our sins then? Uh, or just some of them? Or what do we need to yeah. do? So it says, what sins should we confess? Before God, we should plead guilty of all sins, even those we're not aware of, as we do in the Lord's Prayer. But before the pastor, we should confess only those sins which we know and feel in our hearts. Mm -hmm. um, so this is in reaction against the practice of, like, you know, making people feel like, uh, which this is something that the, the Roman church was doing in Luther's day, making people feel like any sins they didn't list out explicitly were not forgiven. Mm. Um, and so Luther is saying, like, that your ability to list your sins is not what gives you forgiveness. So you don't have to, like, know all of the things you've done wrong. You mm. just need to be sorry you know, for the fact that you're a sinner and you can list any sins that are weighing on you. Yeah, yeah. Which which kinda of makes that absolution like much more of a of a gift. It's it's there for um uh, you your like relief, uh not not to be a burden as if you've got a uh you're obligated to go to confession and like confess all these things. Because the truth is we can't that. we can't even right. even if you wanted to list all of your sins, you would miss one. <laughs> right. Right. Because uh, we sin without knowing it. Yeah, yeah. So well that's cool. And this also kinda of reminds me of a, a couple of things that we pray in the Lord's Prayer, right? Now I gotta let you know in the class we don't actually uh look at the Lord's Prayer uh, we, we don't have a, a podcast episode or a lesson dedicated to just the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and so we intersperse the Lord's Prayer throughout because a lot of a lot of the Lord's Prayer has connecting points to things that we study. So, uh, But this, this kind of ties to both the fifth and the sixth petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, so the Lord's Prayer is broken up into petitions, which is mm -hmm. like the list of things we're asking God for, right? right? Um, so look at the fifth, fifth and sixth. And sixth. Yeah. The fifth petition, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So what does this mean? We pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would not look at our sins or deny our prayer because of them. We are neither worthy of the things for which we pray, nor have we deserved them. But we ask that he would give them all but to us by grace, for we daily sin much and surely deserve nothing but punishment. So we too will sincerely forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. The sixth petition, and lead, not, lead us not into temptation. What does this mean? God tempts no one. We pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory. Mm. Cool. So in the fifth petition, we're, we're asking for forgiveness, but also that um, because we've been forgiven, that God would give us a forgiving heart to forgive others. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're also uh, asking God in the sixth petition to um, to kind of be with us and aid us um, in, in our temptation uh, and to, to resist sin. Mm -hmm. cool. I like that there's that clarification in there that God is not the one who tempts us. <laughs> right. Right. Because right. so that is sometimes kind of hard, confusing. All right, well, let's go to our last means of grace and talk about communion. Um, so we're going to talk about where Jesus institutes communion uh, in Matthew 26, verses 17 and 29. And as we listen to this, uh, let's talk about how, how does this tell us what communion is and what communion is for. Okay. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, is it I, Lord? He answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. 
It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Mm. All right, so so here you've got Jesus like establishing this this supper for Christians to um, practice uh, throughout their time on earth, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and he gives this supper, um, and this is the night before he's crucified, so he's giving the supper as as really a way to distribute the sacrifice that he makes on the cross. Um, so so as we think about that, then uh, what what four things are present in the Lord's Supper? Can you read that for us? It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to eat and to drink. So right. we've got the body and blood of Jesus yep. and we have the bread and the wine. Bread and wine. And they're, they're pre- all present, right? Yep, all, all four at the same time simultaneously. Mm-hmm. So then uh, is the Lord's Supper truly Jesus' body and blood? Uh, let's let's go to that, that question then on um, uh, pages three uh, page 324, um, and uh, look at question 350. Yeah, so this question is, why do we take the words, this is my body and this is my blood at face value? Mm. Only our Lord's words establish the sacrament. They are to be taken at face value to mean what they say because of the following. A, these words are spoken by Christ our Lord, the word to whom all authority in heaven and on earth is given, and through whom the universe came into existence. Um, so Got basically <laughs> making the point that when Jesus' word actually is creative, it creates yeah. things, right? It's more powerful than anyone else. If he can word. say, let there be light, he can have his body and blood be present in this mm-hmm. supper. These, okay, B, these are the words of a special covenant or testament spoken on the eve of his death, and no person's last will and testament may be changed once that person has died. Mm. Um, C. These words of Jesus recall God's covenant with Israel in Exodus 24, 1 to 11. Then the blood of the covenant was thrown against the altar and on the people, giving access to God, so that the elders of the people of Israel beheld God and ate and drank in his presence. In the Lord's Supper, we receive Christ's true body, true blood of the new covenant or testament, and in it the forgiveness of sins and communion with our God. Mm. And then there's also that, that God's word uh, teaches in the sacrament that, um, that the bread and wine are a communion or participation mm-hmm. in the body uh, and blood of Christ. Yeah, so going to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16 for that. The, right. These verses are all in your catechism, right. so you can look them up. Um, we're skipping a lot of them, but there's a lot mm-hmm. of scripture in here. Um, and then God's word clearly teaches that those who misuse the sacrament sin not against bread and wine, but against the body and blood of Christ. So right. in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, we have that verse, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Mm. So then we could maybe talk about that, like what, what makes us worthy to receive the supper? And then maybe who should not be taking the Lord's Supper, right? So, so we would say simply, and you can see this in your catechism too, uh, uh, who who's worthy is is those who believe Jesus's words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Um, so why is this bread and wine his uh, true uh, body and blood? Well, it's it's there for your forgiveness. So you could literally chew on forgiveness, right? Um, and then uh, those who should not be taking communion. Again, you can read this in your catechism, question three hundred seventy four. Uh, those uh, who are not baptized. Uh, or those who are unable to examine themselves. So there's maybe a difference from baptism, uh, where uh, in, for communion you need to be able to examine yourself um, and, and, and to receive instruction, which we are going through right now in this class. Um, and then those who would be of a different confession of faith, since this supper is a testimony to our unity in doctrine. 
Um, and then those who are unrepentant, who don't actually believe that they need or want uh, the forgiveness of Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe also those who are unforgiving, uh, who don't want to give that forgiveness that they've received. So, to others. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we will uh, dig deeper into this, but you can uh, uh, prepare your thoughts and questions for discussion based on uh, those, those questions in your journal. So how does baptism rebirth you into the story of God? How do we use our baptism? Uh, if Jesus accomplished forgiveness on the cross, why does he command the church to forgive sins? Uh, and then finally, why should we receive communion often? Thank you.